Hello? Hello? All right. Is it time? I don't know. We got a couple minutes still. <laughs> don't know any jokes. didn't get the bird crowd out today, this week like we did a couple weeks ago. <laughs> the bird crowd was here, filled up the place. Oh, oh, right, right. STEM day. Whenever, whenever you're ready to go. Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I have the honor and privilege of uh, introducing today's presentation. Uh, Dr. Darren Dudo is here today to present to us um, information about his sabbatical, but before he does that, I want to give you a little background on him, and I was just chatting with him beforehand, and it's just so interesting to see the breadth of knowledge and breadth of research he has done over the years, um, and I think you're going to really um, be interested in that and how that has led him to where he is today, which I'm sure he'll talk a little bit more about. So um, here's some background. He has a BS in physical education, biomechanics from UC Davis. He has an MS in exercise science from University of Colorado and Colorado Springs. And while he was there, he did an internship in the Olympic Training Center uh, working for US Swimming and the national team development for the 1996 Olympic Games in stroke technique analysis. So very cool, Olympic coach. Yeah. Uh, PhD in human performance from Oregon State University, where he did some speed skating work at the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. Um, he did his dissertation on the effect of fatigue on endurance running. And then he spent five years as an assistant professor at Cal Poly Pomona in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion. Um, while he was there, he worked on research in equine mechanics doing, during jumping and trotting. Um, he also did several projects on the effects of eccentric exercise on running mechanics and efficiency in triathletes. So he's been here at EOU since 2004. He's a member of both the American Society of Biomechanics and the American College of Sports Medicine since about the mid-1990s. So this breadth of knowledge is going to share what his latest research has been while he was on sabbatical. So please welcome Dr. Darren Dudo. Well, thank you uh, very much, Rhonda, for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to be able to come talk about some of my research today. Uh, and uh, I included a lot of those things in my bio because I've had a, done a lot of different, I had a lot of different experiences. I've not followed one specific research path. And uh, this past year, I got to go down another research path. And so uh, it's really kind of been an exciting time for me. It's fun to talk about. Um, so I wanted to talk about the, I wanted to start this presentation just talking about sabbatical. So uh, those of you that have gone on a sabbatical, uh, recognize uh, what it can do for you mentally and it can be very encouraging. And when I started my sabbatical just over a year ago, I had a specific purpose in mind. Um, I had a project idea and it turns out that that project idea fell way down the list during the year and I ended up doing a lot of other things that were a lot of fun. And some of those things sort of fell in my lap. And I uh, fell into the piano uh, field once I was gone. I have to preface everything by saying that I am I'm not a pianist. I don't really play the piano. I'm a brass instrument player. I play trombone, far cry from a, a, a playing the piano, which uh, is, is fine. At least I have some musical background. It's a good thing I have an expert uh, in piano playing that helped us out. <coughs> so the first thing that uh, I just Again, on my sabbatical, I went to Duluth, Minnesota, and I, people always ask me, why Duluth? Uh, you know, that's Midwest, upper Midwest. It's cold during the winter. It's snow. You know, they're very hardy Midwesterners. And one of the reasons why I went was because of the multimedia um, across disciplines lab, or the Mad Lab is what they call it. Uh, Mad Lab, one of the founders of it was a good friend of mine named uh, Morris Levy, Dr. Morris Levy, which I will be talking about him additional or, or as I go forward. The Mad Lab is a facility 
that is set up to do motion capture amongst other things. They do a lot of uh, broadcast, uh, uh, journalism, uh, they do theater and arts in there, but they also set it up for motion capture. So um, this is a green screen, this is a test subject, not, we did, weren't collecting data, we were doing some pilot work with the subject, and you can see she's got reflective markers, and um, around this uh, perimeter there's a bunch of motion capture cameras, there's, uh, the floor is a series of uh, force measuring platforms so we can measure ground reaction forces. This facility is the reason why I went. Uh, they set this up uh, it, in part to do this kind of research, and they weren't, they're not doing much motion capture research for biomechanics purposes. And so when I was talking to my friend Morris, I'm like, hey, I'm going to come out. You've got all the equipment. I've got this great idea. Let's do this project. And so my original idea was to measure the stresses put on the, a person during using a Pulaski firefighting tool. It's very commonly used by the wildland firefighters. That's what she's holding here is a Pulaski and uh, something to dig and that kind of thing. So that was my original purpose to go to Duluth was they had this facility. I knew a guy that uh, helped set it up. I could get in there. They let me use it pretty much carte blanche. I got to do all kinds of testing in there. Um, this was one project we worked on in there that there were other ones. Uh, we did all kinds of fun stuff when we were in there too. Uh, we got to dress up in funny costumes and wield a Pulaski while being motion captured with all kinds of fun videos that hopefully will never show up on the internet. And of course I got to explore Duluth, which is a very pretty country, country actually in the fall, um, in the spring when there's not like 10 feet of snow on the ground. Uh, I was out riding a bike one day and took a picture of Lake Superior in the background. This, this is the bridge in Duluth, that kind of thing. So anyway, it was a great place to go for a sabbatical. So that's why I went to Duluth. I had a friend there, somebody who I uh, wanted to work with very much, and they had a great, great facilities and were open to my work. Um, uh, what, what happened when I got there, uh, I had this big plan for this Pulaski project, and we got started on that, and hey, we've got this other project we need some help on, on piano playing. And We've, we've got this, uh, we've got some data that we've been working on. We've got, we need some help because we just don't have time to get through this. And so we started talking about the project. And the initial project was a scale study where they uh, were looking at hand kinematics, which is motion of the hand in pianists as they were playing a uh, C major scale. And they were comparing pianos. So does the piano change the way the pianist plays these scales? Very simple. Um, kind of uh, uh, setup, very simple idea, very difficult execution, okay? So that's, that's one. So I got involved in these piano studies. And the question was, uh, uh, are keyboards different? So the, does a pianist play with, with uh, different keyboards? And so uh, they tested four keyboards. I'm showing three up here. I'll talk about the fourth in a second. Um, two of them were electronic keyboards. Uh, one of them was this Kawai keyboard, which actually will come into play when I start talking about focus of attention. This uh, the Kurzweil keyboard, and then an upright Yamaha mechanical piano with regular uh, hammer and strings and that kind of thing. Um, the keyboards were matched for uh, size. The keyboard keys were the same width and length and things like that. And so these were used to then, um, sorry, I'm looking for my, there it is. Oh, uh, these were then used to then test pianists and see if they, they were different. That's kind of the easy, uh, the easy question to this. Um, the fourth piano that they tested was a grand piano, which of course we are very familiar with here. We just got a new one over in the, uh, in the um, music theater department over there. Grand pianos are great. They're very touchy and they're very shiny. And so when you're trying to do uh, motion capture on them, there's a lot of reflections on them. And you'll see in just a second, that ends up being a real problem. So the grand piano was one of the most interesting instruments we could test, but we couldn't because of uh, some limitations. Well, we, we could, it's just taking a lot longer for the analysis. Um, the pianists played on these pianos, they played the scales at a rate of 60 beats per minute, four notes to a beat. So there was, uh, they was pretty quick, right? It was a pretty quick scale. Um, and it looks something, well, we'll get there. It looks something like this. So the Hands were set up with a hand model, and you can see that, uh, for those of you that are watching live stream, can't see the pointer. I'm sorry about that, but I'm pointing to the markers on the hand. They put, we put retroflective markers on the hand that can then be tracked with the camera, and they played uh, right and left at the same time scale. So uh, the right hand began on middle C, the left hand began one octave below it, 
And the finger pairings left, right are shown here. If you've played scales, then you know exactly what this says. Um, and this will become important as we talk about the data. Uh, and so we, we measured their fingers going across the keys. And it looks something like this. See, pretty quick, um, you can see the markers on the hands. This setup is a frame. It's got some cameras on it. I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, they played the scale 10 times on each piano at that rate. So we had 10 scale up and down trials, uh, ascending and descending, um, with a brief pause in between. Uh, we were doing uh, motion capture with the cameras. And uh, so what we end up uh, from that Oh, uh, one other thing, they were asked to play legato. And uh, the musical, uh, when you attack a note, you can do it in different styles. There's lots of different ways to do it. We asked them to play legato. And legato means as smoothly as possible, so fast but smooth. And that ends up being really important for our analysis as well. When we track the hands, we end up with a, a three-dimensional model that uh, is representing the hands and the wrists. And so you can see that the different colors are the different fingers. This is the right hand. Here's the thumb. Uh, uh, index finger, the pinky's out here. The left hand, here's the thumb. Index finger. And uh, we can play, I can play this clip real fast so you see what it looks like. Okay, uh, that, that's it, that's a short clip. So, <clears throat> so that was one scale. So that was the performance, one scale, ascending and descending. Um, we were filming this at uh, 240 hertz, which 240 frames per second um, rate. I don't know if you can see this, it says 25,000, this is about 30,000 frames total for the 10 scales. So we're talking about a tremendous amount of data. 240 frames per second, um, resulting in 25,000 frames of video footage with all these points. And uh, these points will track manually, or I mean automatically to a certain degree. The software will track it. We had to do a lot of manual tracking. Um, I spent about two and a half months last year tracking these points and identifying whenever a finger was on a key. So it, it's a time intensive thing. We tend to think of automation, it makes this really easy. We were talking about these little small hand markers. Um, uh, you know, placed on the fingers, trying to track them. It ends up not being as automatic as we'd like. Uh, so it took a, a fair amount of time to get through the, the tracking process. <clears throat> the great thing about doing this was I got to learn this software. Um, this is a, a program called Motive, and it's designed to uh, capture and allow the tracking of this type of motion. Um, so I spent a lot of time in this figuring out how to use it, how to get good data, um, from it, how to get the cameras to interface with it, be able to track these markers, uh, be able to export the data into some other software. So that was actually a really good experience was to learn the software because it's really inexpensive. And um, it's something that uh, I'm going to try to pursue uh, obtaining later just because it, it's such a great tool and it's really good for, for this kind of thing. We generate, um, uh, this is all three-dimensional data, so we gener generate XYZ coordinate data in three dimensions. And then we can calculate angles, um, uh, velocities, whatever we want from this data. It's a, it's a whole big data set that we um, dive into. <clears throat> we took it simple at first. So the first thing we did was we tried, what's, what's the easiest analysis that we can do with this data that would give us some idea if there's difference between the pianos? And so we went with just some temporal analysis, looking at the timing of the finger strikes. And so what we did is we took the Z coordinate um, this represents the vertical Z of the fingertip of each of the fingers. So the thumb, which is first, second, third, fourth, fifth digit. We took the, the fingertip marker and we found the Z coordinate, the up and down. And from that, we could track the motion across the keys. 
So what you've got is um, use finger one. This is the finger coming into the key. This bottom, where it bottoms out, that's when it's on the key. And you can see that's level. So all these finger strikes, those all represent when the key is pushing the key down. Um, this stuff up here is when the finger's moving. Um, and it's not just up. Usually it's moving side to side as well. Um, so this, this is the vertical movement of the finger. And so we decided to look at dwell time. Dwell time is the time that the finger spins on the key. Okay? It's, again, it's an easy measurement. It's easy to tell. Um, it's, it's used in the literature, this idea of dwell time. So we calculated dwell time. What made uh, part of the, the time-consuming task with the 3D data is we had to find when the finger was on and when it was off the key. So we had to go through and visually identify this. So that was uh, you're talking about you know, 10 scales uh, and multiple pianos and multiple subjects. And so it just took a while. So that's dwell time. We calculated overlap time. And overlap time is just simply the time that two fingers were on a key at the same time. Because they were playing legato style, um, that each note wasn't distinct. There was a little bit of overlap when the finger was on the key. Um, and so uh, we wanted to use this measure as a degree of legato style. And then we calculated total movement time, which was simply uh, the time from one note to the next note. So uh, movement time is the time from the next note, overlap time, dwell time, how long it's on the, the uh, key. So this is what we get from that. <clears throat> there's, there's a lot going on here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through this. Uh, and we looked at this and said, huh, or the first time we pulled this up. So the first thing is that there are six, six lines under each of these three variables, our dwell variable, the overlap variable, and the movement time. Uh, so there are six lines, one for each piano and left and right hand. Each of the lines is an average of uh, 10 scale trials per subject across seven subjects. So we're talking about an average line across all the subjects and scale conditions. Um, and they're pretty tight, which means that the standard error, if I would plot a standard error around those bars, it would be pretty small. So everybody tend to do this pretty consistently across the conditions and trials. Um, and it looks really messy. I mean, it looks like, hey, that one's going up and down a lot. Well, what does that mean? It, it looks kind of disorganized, but it looks like there's something there. So we, we thought this was really interesting looking at this. Hey, there's something going on here. We would expect that if a, you're playing a scale really smooth at a given rate um, and you're trying to play legato, that everything would be even, right? You would have even movement time. You'd have even dwell time. You have even overlap time. What, one of the things that was crucial for us is that the movement time was 0.25 seconds. Because that means that they were going, staying at the rate, four notes per uh, second, right? That was the rate at which they were supposed to be playing. And you can see, for the most part, it does across the entire scale, except for this very last note. Um, they're at about 0.25 seconds. There's a little bit of variability, but nothing significantly different than 0.25. So they held the rate consistently across all the scales, all the pianos, everything. Um, everything was, uh, was held really consistent. Um, and uh, as we go across the scale pairs, these scale pairs represent these finger, finger pairings. So during the ascending phase, it's these finger pairs going down this way. During the uh, descending phase, it's just going back in the other direction. So uh, le uh, pinky and thumb playing at the same time here at this end, and then ending with the pinky and thumb. This last movement time value kind of looks like the oddball here, but the very last note, a lot of times they held. When they finished, do, 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 and they held it before they took the thumb off. So you end up with this little bit of extended uh, movement time value. All right, so we have this data, this, this data that looks kind of messy. But if we think about it in a different way, it starts to look a little bit more organized. And so what this plot represents the same variables. Here's movement time, dwell time, and overlap time. And uh, this is for just part of that graph. And this is by finger. So finger 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So on the left side, it would be going the ascending. So starting with 5, going up to 2. And then for the right hand, it would be the uh, 
descending, going from five down to two. So it's the fingerprinting. So what we're doing is essentially comparing the left ascending and the right descending. And you, say, you can see it gets much more organized. A lot of that really jumpiness and kind of disconnect goes away. And we're left with this kind of smooth pattern. And what we noticed here right away was these valleys line up. So there's a valley here in the dwell time. There's a valley here in the overlap time. And these valleys mean that there's less overlap. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the less dwell time, the fingers on the key for a shorter amount of time, and the overlap goes down, uh, which is really cool. I mean, it's very consistent. And it always happens before the thumb. So the thumb is the key. And what happens before the thumb? So we've got um, uh, finger two, right? It's the index finger before the thumb. Finger two again, index finger before the thumb. Finger two, index finger before the thumb. So we, so something interesting happening here. And what even makes it more interesting is this, uh, th the third finger, the two fingers before, also starts to change, become different. So this would be the middle finger going into the second finger and thumb, middle finger, and middle finger again. So that the changes start two fingers before. Um, and this was pretty interesting to us because what's going on with, again, you hear smooth notes. If you, you heard that when she played the scale, everything was smooth. Da, 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 you don't hear any of this in the playing. But it's very apparent that less time on the key, less overlap time, um, still results in smooth time, uh, smooth movement. So what's happening here um, at this time? Uh, five, four, three, two, one, and then the hand crosses over the thumb. So as the finger leaves the key, the hand is having to move to cross over the thumb. So you're getting hand movement here, here, and here. And so in order to move the hand, uh, the, theoretically, this is what's happening, right? In order to move the hand, you have to bring the finger off the key quicker, OK? Now, that seems, well, isn't that obvious? The, key, the, the smooth playing is what makes it not quite so obvious, right? The movement time is held consistent. The dwell time, the um, overlap time goes down. And you're preparing for this note. And what makes it even more tricky is that two notes before changes, two notes before. So there's some anticipation of having to move the thumb. So the neural mechanisms involved in moving the hand, even at, at, with rapid playing, are starting to anticipate having to move, even though they haven't yet. And so you start to change the dwell time and overlap time, which is pretty cool stuff. Now, this is just, um, this is just the ascending and descending. I did not throw up the graph for the other direction with left descending and right ascending. It looks exactly the same, does exactly the same thing. Uh, so <clears throat> we got to this point and decided this was cool stuff. So we wrote a manuscript. It's been, uh, we, we've got to uh, do a few um, edits to it, but it's been accepted into music and performance. Um, there's some real interest about this, looking at this in this way across the piano. Unfortunately, we didn't find any differences across the pianos. So the pianos were all the same. So it didn't matter if it was one of the electric keyboards or if it was the Yamaha, they all were the same. Although one of the reviewers suggested a different statistical analysis that maybe look at it in a different way, and we're looking at that right now to see maybe there might be a difference. One of the keyboards, uh, this one, was a little wonky on a few measures, and I believe it's the Kurzweil. But it, so there might be something there, but we didn't find anything with these analyses. And we ran a fair amount of statistical comparisons, trying to tease out the keyboard differences, and there was nothing there. So anyway, it's pretty cool stuff. The patterns are really neat, and it gives us something to move on to, which is the hand angles. So this is where I'm at right now in this data set. All that stuff you saw, that was about five or six months worth of work last year to get to that point. And now I've been working on looking at hand angles. And so uh, this represents an entire scale trial. So this is beginning of the scale, end of the scale. Um, there are eight trials on here from one subject. So this represents data from one subject. Eight trials from one subject matches up really well. They're very consistent across the trials. Um, this is the wrist frontal plane angle, which is this angle. So um, uh, if you go in this direction from the bottom, oh, I'll get to that in a second. So then the middle is where you turn, it's the turnaround. I always call it the turnaround. That's where you hit the top of the scale. You ascend and then descend. So this is going up the scale, going down the scale. Um, down here we have the 
frontal plane angle. And so when the angle is uh, increasing, that's when you abduct. And abduct is when the thumb moves towards the wrist. So it means the hand is moving in, in this direction on the scale. That would be the hand rotating uh, to move the uh, forward. And when it's decreasing, then it would be in the other direction. And so you can see these periods where the hand adducts, it adducts, this is where you're getting the crossover. So you're getting this change in time. Up here is the thumb angle. And <clears throat> in the thumb with the left side, the thumb is going to flex. It's either, it's either going under the hand to move a note, or it's being flexed as the hand moves over the note. And so in this plot, if the angle is decreasing, that's when the thumb is flexing. This is when it's ex uh, extending, going the other direction. And so what you have is this, when the, the crossover, the thumb flexes, to, uh, flexes and then extend, the wrist abducts and then adducts. And uh, you're, again, you're thinking, well, that sounds uh, like that's what should be happening. But you can see it's not consistent, right? Depends on the scale. And where my interest is really is when you move the thumb, you flex the thumb and you abduct the wrist, you're, you're uh, basically putting pressure on the, the thumb joint down here, the carpal metacarpal joint. And so that's at risk for injury. One of the things, one of my colleagues is a pianist, and we talked a lot about hand injuries in pianists, overuse injuries and things like that. And when you're having to do this kind of motion where you're getting wrist abduction and thumb flexion, you're at increased risk for injury. So right now, uh, we're busy pulling this data out to look at the relationship between the thumb angle and the wrist angle during these movements. Because I think when you get these big changes in flexion and extension of the thumb combined with the abduction that you put increased pressure on the thumb. So um, that's where we're at with this data right now. And uh, this, is, uh, this is within the last about three weeks I pulled this data off. Okay. So that's study number one. Now, <coughs> that, and that, was quite, that was a lot, and we're still working on it. But that leads us to study number two, which is a focus of attention. Um, when we were working on this, uh, these scale data, we decided, well, what's another project we can do with piano? And we uh, talked about lots of different things, but we decided on was this idea of focus of attention. So I'm going to switch gears to focus of attention. And what focus attention, uh, attention, there's lots of different ways to think about it. But what we are focusing on here is whether or not the performer uh, has an internal focus or an external focus. An internal focus means that they are concentrating on moving their body parts. So moving their hands or their arms or their head or whatever it might be. An external focus is when you focus on the movement outcome. So what is the result of the movement? So when you focus inter internally, you're having to put a lot of that processing power into controlling the joints and the muscles and things like that. When you focus externally, you're not really worried about that stuff. You're just focusing on what happens, right? What, is, what is the outcome I'm trying to, to produce? And so there's lots of research on um, focus of attention in sports, athletic activities. Um, and it's very well established that an external focus of attention is much better for sports performance. Um, one of the classic early studies was something called the quiet eye experiment, where they took golfers, uh, they took non-golfers, and they brought them in to putt. And they didn't teach them how to putt. They just said, focus on the hole. Look at the hole, see the ball go in the hole, and then have them putt. And that was enough to improve putting performance. Not even talking about mechanics, just focusing on the hole. So these external focus activities are, uh, is, are again, very well established. To some degree with musical performance. There's less literature on focus of attention in music performance, but it's there. And there's even less when you actually look at movement kinematics. Most of it is on aesthetics. Um, what we were interested in, does it affect the way a person moves? So we decided to test this. If we, uh, give the focus, if we um, have a person have a specific focus of attention, does that affect their movement kinematics, the way they move when they play a piece? So that's, that's how our discussion progressed. Um, and that's how we got to this point. Um, the other thing, so we were interested in whether or not it uh, changes the way the person moves, but we also wanted to, to look at if it changes the perception of the performance of the person. So if you were watching a person who had an external focus or an internal focus, would that change how you saw the performance? Or th would that change you heard, right? So there's two sides to this. Does it change what the performer does? Does it change the perception of the listener? And the perception of the listener is a really cool idea. We couldn't quite go that far with this. We are looking at the quality of the musical performance. But it's a, it's a good question. And I know that up in um, my, my colleague Morris is up in, in Canada right now. And they, they're really interested in this. If you look like watch a conductor, what a conductor does, does that affect how the audience perceives the performance? 
So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. And anecdotally, we'd say, sure it does. But there's no, it's not been like scientifically proven. All right. So what we needed to do was find a, start off finding a good musical piece. So we, what would be something good to play that we could that was, wasn't too difficult that we could assess pretty well kinematically? And so we chose this song. Uh, this uh, uh, Bella Bartok has the seven Romanian folk dances. Uh, uh, Tracy, my musical colleague, said number two would be a good one. And there are several reasons why number two is a good one. Um, it has these. Uh, it's short, so you can see it's a very short musical piece. It's repeated, so they played it twice. And it's got these nice little runs in here that are staccato, which means they're short, the fingers move in sequence, and um, because they're staccato, there's definite breaks in the notes. It makes it easier to look at. And these runs happen several times. There's one there, see there's a little one there, there's these guys down here. So it, it speeds up the analysis. There's no hand crossover. One of the big problems with doing this is when the hands get close together, all the markers, all the start to look mushy in the computer program. They start jumping and misidentifying label and things like that. So the hands kind of stay apart, which speeds up analysis on our end. All the fingers are involved. Um, and be, so we can look at, uh, we're really interested, in, of course, in the thumb and uh, the pinky. They get played, played a lot. But what happens with the other fingers as well? Um, so it's, it's a nice piece. Um, <clears throat> so this is what it sounds like. And I have to thank Tracy, my colleague. Uh, I didn't have a good clip with somebody playing the song. So uh, she, yesterday, sat down and recorded herself playing it so that we could, we could look at that. So uh, this is her playing it yesterday in her office in New York while there was a snowstorm, I think. Um, if I can control the mouse, I have to look at it, sorry. So short, and um, it's relatively easy. Uh, it's a nice, nice analysis. Uh, it gives us a chance to do a good analysis. Um, so, uh, so we chose that. So here's what we did, uh, just kind of general procedures. I'll try not to take, go over this in too much detail, but it makes it kind of interesting. We had four different conditions. They played under what we called a preferred or baseline condition, and that's where they, the, former just kind of came in and played it however they felt. However they practiced it, they just played it that way. They felt comfortable playing. And then we gave them three conditions which we randomized. We presented in randomized order. An internal focus condition, an external focus condition, and a metronome condition where they played to a metronome. I'll explain those a little bit more in a second. Um, they always played their preferred condition first. And then they played one of the other three in random order. And they just they got one shot at it. They played it, went through. Um, we did a full upper body marker set, um, so we can look at movement kinematics from their basically their waist up, um, and uh, including their hands, so we can look at not only their playing, but what they were doing with their body while they were playing. Uh, we also, so we recorded the video, we also recorded data from the keyboard. They played on the Kawaii keyboard that I showed up there earlier. It's a digital keyboard where we can output a MIDI file. Um, and uh, the MIDI data file is great because it has um, the note they played, so it's really easy to tell if they played a wrong note because it shows up in that MIDI file. It also gives you information like how fast you press the key and you can get tempo from it. You get all kinds of data just from that MIDI file. They're really sweet. And you can do that using GarageBand in, in, on a Mac. Um, we talked to them before and after. We asked them things like, how much did you practice? Um, uh, how do you feel about this piece? You know, that kind of thing. And then afterwards, you say, which one was the hardest? Which one was the easiest condition? Um, which one did you feel more comfortable? Which one felt less, least, less comfortable? That kind of thing. Um, and then uh, we uh, are using professional musicians that weren't part of the project and the MIDI files to help rate the quality of the performance so we can rank the four, which one uh, sounded the best. Okay? And I would say we're still in process of that. The MIDI files, because we can tell where the wrong notes are and things like that, 
That allows us to do one assessment of quality, but we want the, the sound quality as well. Um, we gave them the Bartok piece a week ahead and, to, and asked them to practice it and prepare it. These were all uh, good pianists. Some of them were faculty, some of them were uh, people on the program. We told them that the, the typical tempo range was between 140 and 148 beats per minute. Written on the piece was 144, so we gave them a range. Um, when they got there, we let them play on the keyboard and in the space, so they got used to it, and you'll see why in a second. Um, we put all the markers on. Uh, there was a total of 72 markers that we put on. Uh, it took a while to get the markers on them. Uh, then they played. Every time uh, they would play the piece in its entirety, and then we would have them do a typing task for a minute. They would turn around. They would have to type. Uh, it was a software that gave you nonsense words, that, like made up stories, and you had to try to type it as fast as you could, or as fast as you can. And we told them they had to type as much as they could in the minute so that they were focusing on typing and not the music, so that, that we called out a washout to give the chance to overwrite the previous instructions. Um, and a lot of them had fun with the typing. Uh, I did not because I was really bad at it. Um, OK, so the key here was that we gave them some specific instructions for the focus and tension. And the instructions were the same for everybody. And we spent a lot of time talking about how to do this. What, how can we write these instructions to get to the idea that we want? And we settled on these. And um, we recorded them, and then we just play them as a recording. So that way it was the same. Everybody got the same instruction with the same tone of voice. And of course, my voice was used because it's very calm and relaxing. Um, and so the first instruction was the internal focus of intention. Now, internal focus is when we want them to focus on specific body parts or specific internal, uh, focus on movements internally, right? So put their thought into moving a finger or whatever. And so in this case, because the song is so staccato, we figured that was a great way to get them to think about how they were, they were moving. So this is, the, this is the text that we use for the um, internal focus. When playing the piece, Mentally focus on the movement of your fingertips related to creating staccato articulation. Okay, That's what they were told. We knew that they were experienced pianists. They knew what staccato was. So that's what we asked them to focus on. Make staccato sound with the notes. Okay, um, And once we gave them the instruction, gave them a few seconds to process, and then they played. For the external focus, that's when we focus on the movement outcome. In this case, with music, we're trying to evoke some emotion or, or idea or thought with the music. That's what music is supposed to do. It's supposed to, to create some kind of reaction. Bartok's uh, a Romanian dance number two was based on what's called a sash dance. So if you go online and you I, I know this because I Googled it, uh, Romanian dance by Bartok, you find uh, uh, Romanian dancers doing sash dances, which are really kind of jump and lively, and they spin. And it's, it's a very dynamic type of thing. So what we did is we asked them to think of that. This piece is an example of a brule, a typical dance from Romania. No idea if I'm saying brule right, but a typical dance from Romania. The brule typically uses a waistband or sash and is characterized by a lively tune with hesitant pauses at the end of each phrase. The dance has quick light steps leading into brief pauses. Mentally focus on evoking this idea of the dance in your performance. So now thinking about the external, think about the idea of the dance. And then the third condition was a, we also called an external focus, but it was on the metronome. Uh, we uh, mentally imposed, uh, or we, uh, we externally imposed a metronome beat. They wore headphones with a 144 beat per minute tap going in the headphones. And uh, this is the cue we used. For this performance of the piece, mentally focus on the beat of the metronome and playing the piece at that tempo. You may deviate from the metronome's beat at the end of the repeat where the retard is indicated. Otherwise, please focus on the metronome's beat. Okay, so those were the instructions they were given. <clears throat> All right, the setup. So this was the data recording space. We had a room where we got to set up all kinds of cameras. Um, and if you notice, it's much different than the scale uh, example before. This is the frame. We, we actually used more cameras. So here's the Kawhi keyboard. This is where the subject is uh, sat. Um, there are, this is what they, this is actually taken from this seat. I took this picture to show what they were looking at. There are 14, or I'm sorry, 11 cameras around this frame, all trained on this, where they were sitting. And there were these three that were behind them, because we had to track all the uh, markers of their body, which again, you'll see in just a second. So they sat in this space. Uh, there's a stand with the music on it. It had the piece. Uh, this black 
uh, cloth to kind of prevent distractions because behind there is cable hell. There's all kinds of cables back here connecting all the cameras into a central hub. Um, here are the headphones. That was plugged into the keyboard so that they could hear the, the, what they were playing and um, uh, the metronome. Uh, here's a subject at the keyboard during the project. And uh, so, so you can see the marker set. Actually, this is Tracy. This is my music colleague. Um, this is, uh, she's got the marker set on the upper body. You can see there's one on her hip. She's got markers on her head, markers on the hands. Here's the camera set up and playing the piece. The uh, Mac sat over there to do the MIDI recording. Uh, back over here was the computer where we recorded data from the cameras. Uh, so that was the, the setup. <clears throat> this is what it looked like once we got the data and we tracked it. Uh, much easier to track this data than it was for the, the scale because we had more cameras. Um, oh, I'm going to have to do this with the keyboard. So here's what it looks like once it was tracked. Oh, uh, that's not what it looks like. Uh, the numbers in those little triangles that are around, these are the cameras. So those are where the cameras were located relative to the space. So we get a, a, a true three-dimensional view of the, of the performance. Ooh, okay, all right. So once we track, uh, track all the, those markers in um, uh, Software, then we build a model. So this is an upper body model that I built using a different piece of software called Visual 3D. Here are the hands, left hand, right hand, forearm, upper arm, torso, and head. Uh, these represent the joint rotational axes, uh, which uh, we use to um, do the hand rotations. Um, and so using this model, then, we can calculate all the variables that we might be interested in, um, which is it, here's an example of that, and I'm just going to do this real quick, if I can find my mouse. There it is. Okay. So as you notice, I think that's it. Yeah. As you notice, there's not a lot of the movement there. You can see the 3D model. Um, here's some, this is the X coordinate of the right hand and right thumb, left hand. This is the pinky finger. This is, our first analysis is what we're calling the first note analysis. So we're just analyzing the very first note of the piece. Because we were thinking that if they change their focus of attention, they're going to have it right away. Even before they start playing, they're going to be thinking about one of these focus of attention. So what are they doing before they play the first note? So the very first analysis that we're doing is this. And you're like, God, what about the whole thing? Whole thing takes a lot longer. This is, this is something that we can do quick. It's a nice little analysis. So um, we use this software to pull out all the, our variables, like our position, our hand angles, and things like that. So that all comes from this software. All right, so um, what does it look like? Here uh, are uh, two of the audio files from two of the conditions. And so it's the, it's the same song being played twice. I'm going to play it, and you tell me, think, tell me if there's a difference.
Yes, they are. Uh, it, it's interesting because when we were, when I was in there recording, we were recording this data, it was obvious when uh, we were giving them a condition, but try not to look at them while they were playing, you know, look away, I'm not going to watch them, and you could hear it. Uh, the first one was the internal focus, which was the staccato. The second one was the external focus, focus on the dance, right? I, I think it's, well, I think it's clear, but I've been listening to this stuff for uh, uh, almost a year now. So I think, it's, I think there's a clear difference. What's tricky is getting it to show up in the movement, right? And so that's the piece that we're working on right now, <laughs> is to see if we can get it to show up in the movement. I think it's really cool, though, that you can hear a different, and that's from a digital file. That's not even like a, an audio file. So, so just, some, just some data real quick. I don't want, uh, uh, here's some um, data from that first note. This is the duration of the first note, and this is taken from the MIDI data. So this is not from the kinematics. So here's the bass line, um, and it's a uh, uh, right and left hand. And we ran some statistics on this, and the internal condition, the note is shorter than, than the bass line, no difference than these. And then we would expect that internal, uh, the, the note to be shorter for internal because that was the staccato condition, right? That was the internal play at staccato. So th there's a significant difference here. Um, we also uh, looked at which hand led because that first note, the pinky and the thumb are supposed to play at the same time, right? So this data shows here, uh, if it's, here's zero. Below zero means left lead. Above uh, zero means right lead. And you can see that it doesn't matter really what the condition is or the subject, the left hand led most of the time. They did in the scale data too. If you look at the first note of the scale, almost always the left hand. Doesn't matter if they're right or left handed or whatever, left hand leads. Um, if we look at their posture going into the first note, uh, their head was held at a higher, uh, they had, uh, sorry, their head was held at a higher angle than it was during the internal conditions. So this is internal, baseline, external metronome. If you look at this data, the average is the orange line. It, this is statistically higher than these guys. So their head position was lowest for internal condition, and then it was uh, uh, more focused, right? Because they got their head down thinking about moving their fingers. And then in terms of their hand movement, we're still analyzing this data, but this is the um, timing of the right thumb flexion angle, left elbow flexion angle. I'm just using a couple of examples. Baseline is on the bottom, internal, external, metronome. And what happens is that the closer to one you get, the closer you're getting to when the note was actually played. So that's the initiation of the note. During the internal uh, focus condition, it took longer to play the note. The external and metronome, it took a little bit, not quite as long, but a little bit longer than baseline. So whenever we gave them a focus condition, it took longer to set up to play that first note. The internal one's the interesting one because I think that means that you're having to actually mentally think about what you're doing to play the note. That's the idea. Play staccato. This is what you have to do to play that note. So it takes longer to do that. All right. So uh, I don't I have no idea what time it is. Oh, I'm doing okay. I thought it was five already. I thought I'd been talking forever. So here's what we're doing with that data. So we're still uh, gonna. We have to evaluate the music still. We're still working on the first note analysis. I mean, a lot of it has to do with timing. We're uh, analyzing eight bars in the middle of the piece, the four bars just before the repeat and the four bars after the repeat. It's a great place to kind of uh, look at those runs um, and it uh, allows us to look at the first note again. So we're actually working on this right now as well. Um, we're looking at gesture for the first note, which is kind of what I was just talking about. We're, we've already pr done a presentation um, at the scale data last summer in uh, Dublin. We're presenting some of this data next summer in Montreal, and then we just submitted an abstract to one down in Melbourne, Australia. Both of those are the first note, looking at first note analysis. Um, so we're still working on that. And um, I just wanted to talk real quick about other sabbatical things. I know I'm out of time. Uh, I also got to do a project looking at ballet dancers. This was presented at ACSLM last year. This is Dr. Morris Levy. This is my good friend. Uh, he and I were uh, presenting this data. And so I got to do another art besides piano playing, got to do ballet dancing. And this was actually looking at knee stress in ballet dancers. And then here's my uh, Pulaski project uh, on a rowing erg and using Pulaski. This is actually a subject that we collected data on. Don't look at his face. And uh, uh, here's our setup. Um, and it was a fatigue, so they rowed on the rowing erg. You can see there's an ax handle. I replaced the handle. 
roll on there for 10 minutes, go use the Pulaski and see what happens. Anyway, that was kind of a fun thing to do as well. Uh, I have to give a big thanks to uh, Tracy, Dr. Lipke Perry from the Crane School of Music in SUNY Potsdam, and my good friend Morris Levy uh, from uh, University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, we were great collaborators. There's Morris back there hiding behind the, the post. Here's Tracy playing. Um, great idea, such great collaboration. It was, it was the best thing about sabbatical was being able to work with two people who were very passionate, had great ideas. We had a lot of great discussions about this, um, did a lot of great things. And so uh, it was a great way to spend a sabbatical with folks like that. And we still, we talk once a week on the project, progress, and things like that. So uh, it's a great thing. And we have additional projects coming up that we're planning. So uh, it's been a great thing. So anyway, that's, that's it. We've got plenty of time for questions, so if you have a question, please take the microphone so that the folks listening online can also hear your question and his answer. So what questions do you have? Nice job, Darren. Um, so uh, I was, this is really interesting for just like understanding this better sake. What are some of the applications um, that could come out of better understanding this type of stuff? So one of the things that I thought of, I'll just tell you what I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Kyle. Okay, yeah, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the applications that I was thinking would be, uh, was in an OT setting where you're looking at like post-stroke rehabilitation and movement and coordinated fine finger movement and these type of things. Because if you had like a massive amount of this 3D data on teeth brushing or other things that are really common, and then you could compare somebody post-injury and look at where they're um, maybe deficient, then you could um, focus on where the therapy was I don't know, what other things potentially? So, so there's a couple things that, that we, our ideas, one is uh, uh, very interested in looking at uh, better teaching methods for young pianists. So um, in terms of the postural component and hand component and protecting the hands and things like that. So part of it's a teaching uh, tool, both in terms of the kinematics and the focus of attention. And then the, the other piece of it is, is very exactly what you're saying. Is there some way to translate this into um, uh, benefit for folks who might have uh, some type of movement related disorder or um, uh, orthopedic disorder. So we've been talking about what about using park, uh, giving it to Parkinson's, pre-Parkinson's, early Parkinson's for that neural outflow. Um, I think that the hand rehabilitation is a good one. So we've been thinking about those things um, and I think that's where we'd like to eventually take it. I think right now we're just kind of in that understanding of okay, what actually is going on when the pianist steps up to the piano Rather, whether it's the hand kinematic piece or the focus piece, and then, then down the road, translate that into some type of application, exactly what you're talking about. So we've, we've had both of those discussions, the, the teaching piece and the, and the injury piece, or the rehabilitation piece. So are you aware of any data then in regards to like, say an individual with dementia or Alzheimer's who uh, was a pianist? or pianist, 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 pianist and yeah. that is, uh, that skill is sort of hardwired in a place that isn't necessarily affected in the same, that's affecting the other parts that are in uh, the dementia and those types of things. Does that data exist? Because, you know, there's, there's data about the impact of music and just listening to music on especially former musicians that are now suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's and those types of things. Yep. So where does that... There, there's no data along this line that I'm aware of. That so that that's relatively unexplored. I think that I think it's understood that when you put somebody into a familiar environment, like they're familiar with music, they hear something, or they you ask them to play, they can pull it out without really having to think about it. I think that data exists, but how that actually relates to the movement piece, I'm not aware of it. But I also say that my I'm peripheral in my understanding of the literature, like the dive in the literature for that piece. We've been f I've been focusing much more on this idea of the preventing injury within the, um, the metacarpal phalan uh, phalangeal, metacarpal, metacarpal joints with the penis. So. Yes, right, yeah. So I was wondering, does the size and the, on the hand one, 
Does the size of your hand and the ratio of like the length of your thumb and your fingers come into play in any of it? I don't, I don't really know what yeah. question is, but I know yeah. that. You no, know, no, so, so some of the things that we're talking about, like the, the movement of the hand relative to the thumb and things like that, does, does a larger or smaller hand play benefit? And I would think that if you're on the extremes, that you might see an effect, but, but most, I mean, we tested a range of sizes of people, so they were, we had uh, uh, one guy who was super tall, had long hands. We also tested a couple of uh, people who were relatively, they were um, lower, below average height, let's just say. And so it had smaller hands. Um, we see the same kind of things, regardless if it's a, if a, a longer hand or, or shorter hand. So I, I think that when we start to get to extremes, yes, but for what we're looking at, and it tends to be more of an effect when you're doing bigger movements. The scale is relatively short, right? Short finger movements, even the, the, um, the, uh, the dance piece is relatively short finger movement. So I don't know if what we have can tease that out, but I also think that it's more of an effect with the, on the extremes. How difficult is it to place for however many markers you have on there, 72 or 32 or whatever you said, in the same, I'm assuming that you're going by joint location mm -hmm. or something yep. on each person. Yep. So you didn't find there was any difference that was significant um, in, in placement of those? Yeah, yeah. So, th I mean, that's a great question. Uh, we all are, we, we're all um, trained in finding the joint center. So placement of the markers tends to be fairly consistent from person to person joints. And then when we take the that track data, when you see the, the three-dimensional data, and we put it into the model, the model is individualized for the person. So we take into account that there might be some small variations um, in marker placement and things like that. So that all gets taken care of in the model building phase. So I would say that we're, we're very consistent in terms of placing markers. Um, and you know, landmarks are a little bit different on people, that people have longer fingers and whatever. And so, um, so there's gonna be some of those individual differences, but they'll get washed out in the model. That's a good question. It does take a long time. Those markers on the hand, uh, they have to put their hand out there, and then we have these little, the markers are uh, three millimeters, and so we have to use tweezers to put them on, and so it's a lot of adjusting to make sure that they get on, and then pressing to make sure they stay, because you don't want them to come off in the middle of a trial, because it, because if it comes off, then you gotta put it on, and you gotta kinda recalibrate everything, so. Well, uh, I'm sorry, but one thing that when we track those markers, one millimeter error. So the error in, in, in reconstruction of the location, one millimeter. So we can, c we can track those markers really accurately. Yeah, sorry, Patty. So I'm not really sure what my question is, but when you first started talking about the scale and yeah. both hands going at the same time, the actions with the fingers are not parallel. Right, yeah. And how difficult that is in developing that coordination with young kids so mm -hmm. that they can keep their fingers on the keys at the exact same time so that they're striking yep. consistently. And, yeah, and that's something that's taught initially, right? A lot of that's one of the first things you learn how to do is a scale. You're taught how to play hand position and play the scale a certain way. And so that, that's taught really young, right? And so um, what, we, what we're finding is that it is difficult, but you, you learn that. And then when you, that those shifted graphs where everything kind of lined up, even though uh, it's the same fingers. They're playing at different times initially, but the patterns are really the same. So even though they're playing at different times, they're playing the same when you match them um, for the finger. So th to me, that's one of the coolest things, that they're, they're playing, like the thumb and the pinky are playing at the same time, but when you look at the two pinkies together, they're doing the same thing, even though they're not playing at the same time, right? In terms of, so that, I think that's really cool, and that's part of that learning process, and it's also part of controlling the scale. Uh, does that answer? Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. It, it, yes. That's exactly right. So, would you say that? I mean, you obviously haven't analyzed everything yet, but it sounds like what you're saying is that, um, as far as piano playing goes, and I would think, as far as any musical instrument goes, external focus is where it's at, rather than internal focus, and especially when you're teaching or learning. Did you, I, and I don't know, I mean, I'm talking as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, at what, would this data help you decide at what point 
you need to focus on that staccato at what point you need to i mean mm-hmm. it seems like you still need to focus on both things mm-hmm. yeah that then that's the interesting that's that's an interesting thing to follow out of this do you just focus on external all the time you can't because at some point there has to be some mechanics right you have to be able to hit the key a certain way or whatever and so usually there's a continuum you spend some time with the external once you kind of start to get an idea, then you go to switch to a little bit more of an internal focus to, to look at the mechanics because you have a better idea of how your body moves and it's coordinated for that task. And then as you get uh, better at the in those, then you go back to an external focus again. So usually there's a, there's, you start with more of an, kind of an external idea, you shift to a little bit more of an internal idea as you're refining. And then once you are kind of got it all fine, and you, you, then you're back to external focus again. So I would say that you, it's not like one or the other. I say you have to use each judiciously. And I, and I think that a lot of times that if you start with an external focus, you give a goal, um, a learner will self-organize it. They will self-organize the movement so that they will figure out the best way to get to that solution on their own and want to do the movement. And once they get there, then you can refine and go to the internal focus. So. I, I, would, I was just wondering, and maybe, maybe you are, are accounting for this already, but I, wouldn't it... Wouldn't it be that the first time through versus the second time through versus the third time through, they have difference in the performance, whether or not, independent of whether it's internal focus That's or external focus? That's why we randomized focus. the trials. Okay. So, it, so the, the focus conditions were randomized so that they were always in a different order. And so like the, that internal, that was not always like the f- second or third or fourth trial. So, well, for one person was a fourth, for another person was a second, for somebody was a third. So it wasn't just like the order of yeah. performance. Okay. The focus trials were randomized to, to prevent exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. We probably have time for one more question. All right. Please join me in thanking Dr. Darren Dudo.